Hello and welcome to the webinar. This is being brought to you by the Kentucky Pollution Prevention Center located at the University of Louisville. I'm Lisa McCracken and will be serving as the facilitator for the session. Today's webinar is a part of the Kentucky Sustainable Spirits and Brewing Training Series. The objective is to help you better understand your water use and identify reduction opportunities to reduce waste and increase savings. KPPC is a technical-based environmental resource located at the University of Louisville's J.B. Speed School of Engineering. We help companies with waste minimization, water conservation, and helping them reduce costs and savings along the way. We're free, confidential, and non-regulatory. So just a little information for those of you who have not worked with us in the past, aren't familiar with us, but um, we're happy to here to help. So I'd like to introduce a key partner who is the Kentucky Division of Compliance Assistance. They have provided a short video welcome and introduction. Welcome, my name is Robin Whitted. I'm a pollution prevention specialist and coordinator for the Commonwealth's Environmental Leadership Program, Kentucky Excel. I work here in the Division of Compliance Assistance. Kentucky's Sustainable Spirits Initiative began in 2011. The goal, bring industry members together to talk and share about sector-specific environmental issues and opportunities. Thus, the Sustainable Spirits Summit was born. Over the years, multiple summits have been hosted by industry members. The first were small half-day meetings, where facilities collaborated to develop a document which shared their sustainability stories with their visitors. Summit participants also networked and discussed sustainability topics and ways to promote green practices at work, in the community, and much more. So much more that in 2017, the summits expanded from a half day to a full day event. As the summits grew, we partnered up with the Kentucky Pollution Prevention Center. With the Kentucky Pollution Prevention Center's help, the initiative is now providing assistance, resources, training, and recognition outside of the annual summit. Keep an eye out for these opportunities as they are released. If you feel like you've missed out or would like to review what we've done, don't worry, everything is available online. While on the web, don't forget to check out Kentucky Excel. As a community of aspiring and established environmental leaders, Kentucky Excel has a membership type for everyone, all which focus on voluntary projects that help the environment, like reducing water use or increasing water efficiency. After the webinar, contact us about technical assistance opportunities or to join Kentucky Excel. Hope to hear from you. Uh, we certainly do appreciate being in partner with the Kentucky Division of Compliance Assistance. And the beginning of the webinar kind of brought you back to the, the history and beginning of this initiative. Hope that you're, that's a little bit of good background information for those who haven't been along with us along the way and for those who are, are new. So let's talk about what we're gonna discuss today. And the topics today are designed to help make you better informed about your water usage along with ba basic water conservation principles. After each session, we'll have a Q&A session and cover a few wrap-up items at the end and then adjourn. As mentioned earlier, if we don't address your question during the session, we invite anybody interested to stay on the line following the official adjournment to address any, any remaining questions or take new questions. 
Now we know it isn't business as usual these days, and we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge KDA member distilleries who have collected, collectively donated nearly 125,000 gallons of desperately needed hand sanitizer across the Commonwealth. This has gone to EMS and first responders, hospitals, nursing homes, hospice, police, foster care centers, and other priority needs. It amounts to about 630,000 750 milliliter bottles. So I know that for the distillers online, you know what you're doing, but for the rest of us out there, we just thought that here at KPPC, you've got a lot to do. We're talking about uh, energy use, water use, but we know you're on the front lines helping us and we really appreciate that. It's no surprise that um, the distilleries have had to retool facilities and source the necessary supplies. And so this disruption in the operations will be something to consider as we talk in today's topic. So I think that as we go along today, just kind of think about normal operations, but also be thinking about the adjustments that you will have made. And we'll mention that a little bit along the way. And I'll also say, if anyone is online who did not see their name on there, please send us and we'd like to give you all a shout out as well. So I thought it'd be interesting to see how production may have been altered during the crisis for any of our attendees. If you please fill out the poll and let us know if you've had any changes, increase, decrease. I guess we know that the alcohol industry has been considered a necessity. Um, don't know if there's an increase in production there, but whether or not you've mixed up your production with the hand sanitizer or maybe even face masks. Oh, interesting. Okay, so those online here have had no change. And then the not applicable would be those people who we have others on the line who aren't a representative of the beverage industry. So that's interesting to know. Okay, at this point, I would like to introduce Samantha Gordon who's a sustainability engineer with KPPC. She'll be talking about water bills, baselining, and benchmarking. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'll do a quick introduction before I get started here. So like Lissa said, my name is Samantha Gordon. I've been with KPPC for about a year now, and I previously worked in sustainability for four years in the manufacturing and sustainability consulting areas. Specific to our Sustainable Spirits and Brewing Initiative, I've worked with several distilleries and breweries on sustainable value stream mapping, understanding utility bills, and figuring out where all of their water is going to. So today I'm going to be talking about the three B's, bills, baselining, and benchmarking. So I'm going to kick it off with another poll question. It's, a, it's an easy one. So do you review your water bills regularly? So this is gonna be one of the main topics I'm gonna be talking about and why this is important. So we'll just give it a little bit to respond. And then, and those of you that are not maybe in the beverage industry specifically, you could answer this on behalf of maybe your house. Do you look at your water bills um, for your, your residents? Share the results. Okay, so it looks like 50% say yes, that's awesome. I love to hear it, that 17% no. Maybe I can change your mind by the end of my presentation. We'll see. So water bills. This is a great place to start at any point in your journey. If water efficiency is something that you're already looking at and water bills is a part of that, awesome. Continue the great work. But if you're somewhat new to water sustainability, water efficiency, starting with your water bills is a great place to begin. So the main thing is to understand what you are consuming. So, and you get that from your water bills. So I pulled a few main things that you wanna look at from your water bills. And we recommend looking at your physical or electronic copy of the actual bill, not just the total cost and total consumption from the bill, because there may be some things within the bill that change that you're not aware of that may cause some increases or decreases in the total price. So the first thing you wanna look at is consumption. How's it trending? Has it gone up, down? Was there a billing error? Things like that. The next one is your charge per gallon. This may or may not fluctuate depending on the water company, but if it does, you want to understand why. Was it just a change in the tariff? Um, is there something you need to go back and ask your water company? Um, just things like that for your charge per gallon. The other thing 
a gallon is a pretty common unit of measure, but there may also be some other unique unit of measures that your water company is going to use. The next one is wastewater or sewer. This could be a separate bill or it could be part of your total water bill. So a lot of water companies are going to assume that the water that you consume is the same water that's going through the wastewater pipes. So water in the building equals water out of the building. And this is a pretty significant portion of the water bill for total cost. So it's an expensive um, thing of the water bill. We do recommend calling your water company to see if there are any options for getting credits. So for the beverage industry, a lot of your water, majority of your water is probably going into your product and you're still getting charged for that wastewater that's even that's going into your product. So we recommend giving your water company a call to see if there's any options for credits, if you can install a meter or even we've seen some success with like getting money back for a leak or for setting up some rainwater harvesting, like planting trees or something like that. So just give your water company a call and see if there's any options for that for wastewater or sewer. The other thing is miscellaneous fees. So this is some administrative fees that your water company is going to tack on. Your total bill is usually not just going to be your consumption times your charge per gallon. There's gonna be a lot of other fees. So take a look at those, see if there are any weird ones that you need to investigate further or if it's just, if it all makes sense, you're good to go. So then the last one obviously is total costs. So one thing that we like to do at KPBC is create an effective rate, and this will be used for water efficiency projects if you wanna see the cost savings, and Mark will get into a few of those later on in the presentation. So the effective rate is the total cost divided by consumption. So you can get your dollars per gallon, so then you can use that later on. Okay, so I pulled up, a Louisville Water Company bill, because that's where we reside. And just to show you that there's a lot of charges on here, this is super busy. I'm not going through all of the lines. Um, I actually chose this on purpose just to show you that there are a lot of different line items on your water bill, most likely. So I pulled this from the FAQ section on the Louisville Water Company website. And if you're not from Louisville, I recommend Googling your water company to see if they have something similar. They had a great FAQ section built out that breaks down all of these different sections. Um, and I only chose Louisville water because it's local to here, but I wanna make a point that water is a very localized thing. Unlike utilities where it's kind of like a regional, maybe state, it goes over state boundaries. Water is usually at the city level. So there's not, there's gonna be several different versions of water bills. So keep that in mind, you're gonna be the expert in your water bill, but we know which charges, which line items you need to pull from that water bill. Okay, so all this information is important to collect. So get your highlighter, if you're looking at it, the physical copy, or if you're online, pull it up in something where you can highlight what charges and what line items you wanna look at. And you wanna collect all of that information to potentially create a baseline. So you wanna first start by tracking all of that data. You can use spreadsheets, you can use Energy Star Portfolio Manager or various online platforms. There are a lot out there. So you wanna look at trends. You wanna to, want to understand what a quote typical month looks like to identify and investigate anomalies. So I put typical in quotes because given the current circumstances, typical is not something that we are ever using. We are we have not used in the past couple of months due to the coronavirus. So maybe 2020 is not a great year to look at for your quote typical month, but just understand that you have to look at your trends more than a year's worth potentially, but several months works as well. So like the graphic is showing, the magnifying glass is zooming in on that one month that spiked up pretty high. So you want to investigate those months, see what was going on. But in the opposite realm too, you wanna to look at the months that are really low. You wanna understand if there's anything going on in that month that you could also apply to other months to reduce your usage. The other thing with baselining is you can use it for goal setting purposes. So like I said, 2020 may not be the best year to set as a, a goal year just because there have been a lot of changes in production for you most likely. But again, if not, go for it. So once you've got your baseline, you've got your 12 months of data, then you can do some benchmarking. So that's comparing your facility, energy, water production, whatever, to one or more other facilities. So we recommend using this as a guide and not a ranking because 
it's not an apples to apples comparison. It's, it's just averages. So don't get too caught up in the details. So I pulled a quote from the Beverage Industry Environmental Roundtable website, when performance is measured, performance improves. And that's something that we see a lot at KPPC, just making your employees aware of what your efficiency goals are and what your resources that you want to conserve are. You, we see an improvement. We see those efficiency gains up to one to 3%. Now don't quote me on that, but that's just something that we've seen in the past. So diving a little bit more into the Beverage Industry Environmental Roundtable, or BEER, they did a big study on the beverage industry. So they collected data from three separate years, 2013, 2015, and 2017, and they collected a variety of data. So power, gas, other different power sources, water, and production. And they averaged all of that to compile some benchmarking. So it was a pretty big study. Approximately 1,600 facilities participated across the globe and diverse facility and beverage types, so small, large, et cetera. And after they analyzed all that data, they were able to categorize it into four different areas, breweries, wineries, distilleries, and bottling. If you want to learn a little bit more about the study, these are just the highlights. I also included the link um, below. So the beer study honed in on three different ratios. So the energy use ratio, the greenhouse gas emissions ratio, and the water use ratio. So Mark covered the first two in our first webinar series, which if you haven't listened to that, it's on our website, kppc.org. Um, so we're just gonna be focusing on the water use ratio. So the water use ratio is the water required for your product divided by liter of production. So that's a 12 month sum summation of those numbers. So your final result is going to be liters per liter. And one note, the liter of production is a volumetric. It's not a proof gallon or anything complicated like that. It's just straight volumetric liter of production. So once they came up with these ratios, then they put together some results. So there were two main takeaways from the report that I found. The first one is that the ratios have decreased over the three-year period, and a lot of that was due to efficiency. The next thing is that there is a correlation between large production facilities and more efficient ratios, so the lower ratios. So that's kind of the economy of scale. So as production increases, your ratios will become lower, therefore more efficient. So I summed up the numbers in this table here shown on the slide. If you know what your brewery or distillery or winery numbers are, you can do a quick look, but we'll get into that a little more. One thing to note, you can see for distilleries water use ratio that they're pretty, pretty heavy water intensive in comparison to breweries and wineries, as well as for energy and greenhouse gas emissions. So if you were wondering if Kentucky bourbon played a role in the beer study, you are absolutely correct. So the Kentucky Distillers Association actually partnered with beer to do a supplemental uh, data analysis comparing Kentucky distilleries to the global distilleries. And so I pulled a couple of charts here that I think tell a really awesome story. So for the first two years of the study, you can see that Kentucky had a higher water use ratio and energy use ratio in 2013 and 2015. But in 2017, you can see that Kentucky distilleries actually dipped below the global average for the beer study, which is awesome. So if there's any distilleries that are on this call, shout out to you. Great work. Uh, that's stuff that we love to see. So if you have not compared your numbers to the beer study, or if you have and it's been a while and you're wanting to do it again, KPPC has come up with an awesome tool to help you do that. It's the SSBI calculator. You can find it on our website. I've listed the link here, kppc.org slash SSB, and you can download the calculator. So this is version two of the calculator. Version one just had energy and greenhouse gas emissions. This one, we added water and we updated some of the figures. So I'm going to pull up the, ca the calculator and do a demo. Okay. So this is what the calculator looks like. So we've got a quick introduction tab that shows you how to use it. And we've got our contact information here as well as some conversion factors. So the next tab is the input tab. So I made up some fake data about a distillery and we'll just kind of walk through. So one of the first improvements that we made was to this drop down that selects what type of facility you have. So this is a distillery and this helps in the figures tab compare it to beer. 
So I filled out all the required information and the thing that we added, so the water use down here. So I added all of the water use for this fake distillery and the water charges. So anything in white is an input tab and anything is ye in yellow is a pre-calculated tab. So you won't need to touch any of the yellow tabs, yellow uh, cells. So once you fill out all of the white cells on this tab, then you can go to the next output tab. And this tab is all calculated, pre-calculated. So once you input all of your data, this will pre-calculate. So down here is where we added the water. You can see we added the, the water use ratio line calculation. So you can compare this number to your beer number. You can also use compare your energy use ratio and your greenhouse gas emissions ratio to the beer study. So the beer study numbers are down here if you want to compare your total number. Or what we like to do is look at the figures. This helps tell the data, tell the story that your data is presenting. So you want to ask yourself, is this the story that I was expecting from the data that I knew that I had? So the first thing that I see when I look at this is that the water is trending pretty well, but it's, it seems to be trending up. So you would want to investigate if there's a leak, is production increasing, did you add more equipment, something like that. Dive into why it's trending up. The other thing that we added was this water use graph down here. And this lime green line that goes through the chart, that's the beer ratio number. So for this, you can see that this distillery is almost above that beer line for nearly every month. So you might want to dive into why that is and see if there's any room for water efficiency projects. Now, like I said, there may not be, depending on the size of this distillery um, or several other factors because you can see for the energy use ratio that they are pretty energy efficient and below the beer number. Um, so the other chart that we added is the water costs per gallon. And you can see this doesn't fluctuate too much. If there's big fluctuations, that's something you would want to dive into. So that was a quick overview of the calculator. This is available for download on our website if you wanna take a look at it. And we will get back to the presentation now. Okay. Thanks, Samantha. And uh, we are very proud of the calculator. That was one thing that um, KPPC developed along with one of our co-op students. Uh, based upon, we've been doing some assessments, working with other facilities, and just kind of realized there's really a, there can be a basic um, template that would be very useful. And then we were able to add the water as well. So we do have a couple questions, Samantha. Okay. One is, with the water use ratio for distilleries, is this water usage just for distillates or does this include bottling, from mashing to bottling? Good question. Yes, the beer benchmarking water use ratio does include bottling for distilleries. It includes the water use from the mash to the bottling, so like the full cycle. Um, Mark is going to show a process map diagram a little later on in the presentation that I think will help understand that. But if you also want to check out the beer website, it goes into further detail. Okay, and a second question. Do you have knowledge of any specific reasons for the significant improvement in Kentucky distilleries decrease in water and energy consumption? That's a really good question. Um, I would say I can speak to kind of just an industry trend. That's something that a lot of consumers um, are pushing for to see in their in their beverage manufacturers. Um, so we've seen that pretty commonly. Um, but specifically to the Kentucky distilleries, I do not know the answer to that. Mark or Lissa, do you guys know? I don't, um, uh, Samantha, no. No, I don't know either. That is a good question. Maybe we'll try to, to see if we can find out. Maybe yeah. we'll contact KDA and see if they have anything they can let us know about. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. At this point, we're going to move on to Mark Toda, also a sustainability engineer here at the center. His, his uh, presentation is going to focus more on um, inventorying and mapping your process and creating a water balance. Okay, thank you, Lisa, very much. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name, again, is Mark Toda, and I'm a senior engineer along with Samantha here at um, KPPC. I've uh, been with KPPC about uh, uh, four years, well, it'll be five years here in um, September. I uh, previously worked in uh, at Penn State University in Pennsylvania for about 25 years doing in a similar type program there at uh, Penn State University. 
Um, I want to mention a couple of things before I get started here. Um, one, I also wanted to um, reiterate uh, to go to the KPPC website, and there are uh, webinar recordings that are very useful, and we have a really nice set of resources that you can uh, can take advantage of as well. They're on the website, so I want to encourage you to to go to our website. Um, that's again kppc.org. Um, Another thing I want to mention is that um, you know for the for the beverage manufacturers that are on the line, we recognize that you are really the experts um, with your equipment and your processes. And you know what we're trying to provide, Samantha and I, are tools and and resources that can help you to do your job. And in this particular case, um, reduce uh, water consumption. Uh, so we're trying to try to give you a framework to uh, to help you with that. Um, the last thing I just want to mention is uh, the concept of water demand. It's kind of interesting. You know, we, we recognize electric demand. Um, you know, we know a 100 watt light bulb is 100 watts of demand. And then if I keep that light bulb turned on for an hour, that's 100 watt hours of usage. So we have demand and usage. And we have basically the same thing with water. Um, Water, the flow rate for water is, in a sense, the water demand. Um, and how long I keep that flow on is uh, going to be my water usage, in a sense. And so that's just a, sort of a concept that I just wanted to um, to present to you all at this point in time to have. Um, Samantha mentioned the beer process boundary. And actually, um, I believe bottling is included in the process boundary. Uh, when we look at the entire sort of life cycle here, we've got agriculture, uh, we have the product, beverage production operations themselves, that's at the manufacturing facility itself, and then distribution to the consumer um, on the right-hand side. Um, so the beverage production operations in the beer study, you know, cooking uh, in the, for distillery, cooking, distilling, fermenting, storing and maturing of and then blending and bottling is all within the process boundary that beer has set so the beer study um you know water use is uh only in that process boundary actually significantly more water is used in agriculture and uh glass making uh than actually in the um, beverage production itself which is kind of an interesting um point so the the, the process boundary, what we're looking at is water use within the, the beverage production operations. Just some uh, interesting uh, facts that show that uh, beverage manufacturers are concerned about water use ratio. Um, for uh, distillery water use ratio, there's a range of, in the beer study, from 9 to 63 liters per liter. The Kentucky average is about 31 liters per liter. So it's interesting that it takes 31 liters of water to make one liter of product here in Kentucky. So that's just, again, an interesting kind of a number. And uh, obviously we wanna to try to bring that number down as much as we can. Water use uh, decreased 4% from 2013 to 2017. So that's kudos to um, the beverage manufacturers. Um, that, Production has also increased, um, and uh, so that has led to an 8% decrease in water use ratio. It just some interesting facts here. Diageo improved water efficiency by 19% from 2017 to 2013. Uh, Bacardi is improved by 40% uh, from 2006 to 2012. I know that's a little bit older data, but it, again, it shows the, the um, attention to water use ratio with these manufacturers. And Brown Foreman has a goal to reduce water use ratio by 30% uh, by 2023. So again, just some interesting facts. I'm sure other um, companies have goals, uh, objectives and goals for water use ratio as well. Okay, so um, assessing facility uh, water use. Samantha has given us a, a great start here, and that's these first two bullets that are grayed out is really basically gathering information, and that's really collecting your, getting a lot of information from your water bills and establishing a water baseline. How much water am I using each month um, for my uh, 
production, but then also you want to get production data as well, which I'm sure you have. You know, what is the how much uh, product is being produced each month? And so this is kind of basic information, a basic place to start. What I'd like to talk about moving forward here now is inventorying water using equipment. What equipment do I have on site that's actually using water? I want to set up an inventory of that. And then I want to be able to map my processes through the facility um, to see how that can, uh, that is going to actually be helpful as well. And I'll show that as we move forward here. And then the last thing I want to give you a concept of to create a facility water balance. And I'm going to show that uh, basically what a water balance is, is taking the consumption information that Samantha talked about from the water bill, that total consumption, how is that broken down in my facility? Um, where is that water being used throughout my facility? And um, that's really what a water balance is. And so we're going to talk about that more in the next couple of slides here. So um, what is a water inventory? Water inventory is a pretty simple thing, um, but it will be useful to take a chart like this, walk through your facility, and identify all the water consuming pieces of equipment at your facility, um, showing the item, what it is, its location is very important, particularly um, you know its physical location, but also what process steps it supports. Uh, the flow rate, what is the flow rate? Uh, if there's a pump or whatever, what's that particular flow rate in gallons per minute that delivers water to that process? And then secondly, what are the operating times for that piece of equipment? I mean, is that run 24 seven? Does, does it run um, you know, two hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon? What are those operating times in, in minutes per day? And then, um, from that, I can get um, from my flow rate and operating time, I can get gallons per day of water that's actually used. And uh, that is actually will be a calculated number there in, in those cells. Um, and of course, we left a spot for comments in case there are any, any comments that you might like add there. So from this inventory, I can actually create a water balance. and. Um, this is a distillery water balance. You can see uh, and these are not actual uh, percentages. They're, um, this is just for illustration purposes, but significant amount of water obviously used in mash cooking. Uh, some water used in fermentation, primarily for uh, cleaning um, in fermentation. Um, in distillation, I'm using water because I need steam to um, in distillation, and so I'm using water in from that perspective. Um, in spirits gauging, you know, when I uh, get the the uh, the spirits to the right proof, I need to use uh, water. Um, and then in the bottling operation, there's a small amount of water used as well. And then there's a miscellaneous bucket, and that actually is a really important bucket. Um, because if that miscellaneous bucket gets too large, especially if it's over 10%, um, that's an indication that, wow, maybe there's a leak or there's a significant amount of water that I haven't accounted for in my processes. So that's an important uh, item. And so basically all of this water use in my facility needs to add up to the total consumption that Samantha uh, mentioned in the, from the water bills. And that's why it's called the water balance. This would be an example uh, for a brewery. In a sense, again, with a brewery, we have 20%, uh, 1%. And again, these are, again, for illustration purposes, maybe 21% of my water consumption is actually going into the product, into the beer. Um, we're going to have vessel cleaning. Um, uh, I'm going to skip domestic right now, but we have packing. Um, there's going to be a small percentage in packing, whether that's bottles, maybe more so with bottles than cans, but uh, some there. Line cleaning. Uh, again, we're going to have a miscellaneous bucket. In this particular case, miscellaneous bucket is kind of large, so that's a little bit of a, maybe a red flag there. But I want to get back to the domestic. Domestic is going to refer to restrooms and, uh, and bars. 
because oftentimes with a either a distillery or a brewery, uh, we may have a, a tap room or a restaurant that's associated with our uh, facility. And so it's important to recognize that. And so when, because there's gonna be a significant amount of water use in bars and restaurants. And so your water use ratio may be slightly higher if you do have a restroom, uh, I'm sorry, a bar or a restaurant uh, associated with your facility. So again, just another point to keep in mind. Okay, um, just an interesting concept I wanna throw out here is this is uh, lean and water and the US Environmental Protection Agency has put out a very nice document called Lean and Water Toolkit, which I highly recommend. It's a very well-written document. And uh, as manufacturers, we're all familiar with lean manufacturing and lean um, uh, tools and they can be applied here um, with for water savings. Um, water gamble walks are just walking through the facility and identifying opportunities for water reduction uh, throughout the facility. Uh, developing a water balance, like I just talked about, um, uh, they talk about here in this document. Uh, value stream mapping is um, something that is very significant, and I'm actually gonna get into talking about value stream mapping in the next couple of slides. Uh, just developing a culture for waste elimination is important. Um, so that's why it's good to get employees involved and uh, get them involved with water use reduction, uh, just to develop a culture for waste elimination. And then total productive maintenance. Um, we may be losing a lot of water for, from leaks and things like that that should be repaired. And so um, these are kind of lean tools that can be applied to water use reduction. I just want to uh, mention water waste. Um, again, this is sort of putting it in, in the lean terminology. What is water waste? Water waste is water used beyond the point of adding value to the customer. So um, obviously putting water in the product is adding value to the product. Uh, when I'm cleaning um, equipment, that's adding value because I need to have a clean equipment for the next um, batch of production that's coming through. Uh, but I don't wanna use more water than is necessary um, to add value to the product. So again, another concept, maybe food for thought to, um, to help in identifying uh, water reduction opportunities. Uh, other thing to remember is water waste, wasted water leads to increased wastewater. Because also all that water that I'm wasting, not only is it not adding value to the product, but now I got to pay for uh, wastewater going out. And so uh, another point there. Um, the cost of water is important as well. The cost, uh, there's water costs, uh, but there's also energy costs if I have to heat up that water. So if I'm using hot water for processes or obviously for steam especially. So I don't wanna use more water than is necessary because there's energy costs associated with that as well. There could be chemical costs if I'm doing any sort of um, treatment of that water. Um, and then obviously there are labor costs also. So there's lots of costs here and that's why it's really important to be sensitive to um, to water use reduction. Uh, and obviously from an environmental perspective, uh, if I use too, more water than I need to, it exacerbates the water scarcity, scarcity concerns. Um, so we're blessed, uh, Samantha mentioned that water is a regional uh, thing and that's really a good point. Um, we're blessed here because we do have water and very good water and that's one of the reasons why spirits industry is so active here in Kentucky. But um, uh, other parts of the country are not as, as so. So when we talk about water efficiency, we're talking about water reduction. Uh, it's reduction in the amount of water per unit of production. That's really what we're looking for. Um, uh, we want the minimum amount of water needed to perform a task. We want to also look at product water use, water that's going actually into the product, and then process water use, kind of separate those two things. Um, there's not too much we can do about the water that's going into the product, that we need to put water in the product, uh, but maybe more the process water use is an area to attack. 
Okay, I have a poll question here now that I'd like to pull up. We just like to do these polls to um, give you all an opportunity to um, to participate here in this webinar. And then I'm gonna be going into um, uh, sustainable value stream mapping. So does your company use value stream mapping to track operational parameters? So I'd like you to choose one of those and uh, then we can, uh, in just a second here, uh, close that poll. Okay, so here are the results here and mine is a little bit small, so I can't really see it too good here. Hang on a second. So we have 20% um, yes, 20% no, uh, and 20% uh, not sure. So which is totally um, uh, a anticipated re response to that question. Okay, uh, so going back to the presentation here, uh, value stream mapping. This is a little bit of, um, I wanna explain what value stream mapping is. We did uh, talk about this last in last year's webinar, so you can look at last year's webinar as well. But I just wanna give some of the highlights here in particular related to water. So what is a value stream map? A value stream map is looking at the product uh, value in, as it increases through the production process. Basically, so we're starting with materials entered here on the left-hand side and going into process step number one, we identify how much water is used in process step number one in gallons. What is the process time? How long does that process take? And for the equipment that I included in my equipment inventory, how long is that equipment, quote, on for? What is the equipment use time? These are things we want to capture in this process step. You can see that the product then goes to work in progress in between these process steps. So there's materials now product that leaves process step number one and it enters now process step number two. Process step number one, for instance, could be mass cooking and now it's moving into a fermentation process as process step number two. Uh, what is the water use in process step number two? What's the process time and what's the equipment use time? So as I'm collecting this data through my process, this is gonna be really valuable in putting together the value stream map. And then again, I'll have work in progress. That Again, that work in progress is my product coming out of that process step number two. I'm gonna move along here just from the, from the uh, standpoint of time here. Um, so what I want to do is put together this, the, this is my entire process. This is again for a distillery where I'm grain handling, mass cooking, fermentation, et cetera, through the process. And you can see the, um, the product as it moves through the process there. Other thing that I included on this slide here now is waste. So um, in, in particularly looking at uh, wastewater, uh, what is the wastewater coming out of each process step? And that would be a good thing to um, get a handle on and to try to re minimize uh, wastewater as well. Uh, so basically what I can do now is look at, um, I can in a sense put plots down below here of various water types. And we have different types of water um, <clears throat> that we're gonna be dealing with as beverage manufacturers. Uh, we could have uh, cooled water or cooling water uh, we may have chilled water, so we want to take a look at that. And we have um, reverse osmosis water as well, which is typically used in uh, putting into the product. Uh, we also can uh, look at electric, uh, I mean, energy usage as well through the process. And then down at the bottom here, I have steam usage. So we want to evaluate steam usage at each step in the process as well. Um, this is again now a brewery process and um, milling, mash, slaughter, boiling and whirlpool, fermenting, aging and packaging. And so we, again, we wanna look at water usage through each step of this process as well. 
So what are the benefits of adding water to a VSM? First of all, we, we, we're going to gain an understanding of where water waste occurs, uh, identify areas to reduce excess water use. Uh, we can then develop efficiency uh, implementation plans, quantify expected savings from improvements. So that's one thing that's really important. If I know how much water is used in a, in a particular process step, um, and I can reduce that by 10% or whatever, then I can actually quantify the savings. And again, you know, as I mentioned before, just creating a culture for efficiency is a really good reason to, um, to work on this. Uh, quickly, some points on management and technologies. I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly, just give us time for questions. Uh, we wanna set up a water management team within our facility. It could be a cross-functional team. Um, we should have a water management policy. What's our company's policy on water management? And we should have specific, specific objectives and goals. Uh, Samantha showed the water use ratio um, uh, tracking. And so what are our goals for reducing water use ratio uh, for our company? Incorporate water management into the environmental management system uh, that your company is already operating under. And um, that would be very helpful. Um, there, these are some water saving strategies. Um, and I'm gonna kind of skip this slide. Well, the one point I wanna make out is the fourth bullet is reuse or recycle water. How can I reuse water rather than just using it for one process and, and discarding it? How can I reuse it or recycle that water? Um, this is an excellent, uh, Resource that's also on our website. This is the Brewers Association of Water and Wastewater Treatment Manual, um, Volume Reduction Manual. Um, this would be a good one to look at. These are some examples of some things that they recommend taking a look at. Again, I'm not an expert at your equipment and your processes, so I'm really not going to talk to these um, in particular, but I will mention that submetering may be um, a useful thing to do. Uh, our total water consumption is metered, obviously, from our water bills, but um, do we need to set up submeters in different parts of the facility? Just a quick example. Um, we This is a uh, distillery in Carbondale, Colorado. They've gotten a lot of press here, and they actually built a brand new facility. They actually recapture 100% of their process water, um, and then they are reusing that water in their uh, facility. Um, they save millions of gallons of water by doing that. Uh, it, there's also a water energy thermal system that's attached to that. So the hot water, hot water is, catch up, is captured and stored for use. And then it's the heat from that is used for process heat, domestic hot water, et cetera. Uh, this is, I just want to mention, this is something to consider for uh, distillers and breweries is looking at solar hot water. This is more of an energy uh, issue here, but uh, using so solar hot water as preheat to a boiler, maybe using the water for cleaning or other processes. So you can get water to 140, 160 degrees relatively easily with solar hot water. Uh, so leaving here, um, this is close to my last slide here. I want, we want you to baseline your water use, complete the water use ratio calculator that's available on our website, develop a water balance at your facility, and then lastly, contact KPPC for assistance. We'd like to assist you with all of these things. So with that, I'll um, entertain any questions that we might have. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, we do have a question for you. Does the water balances for each process include the water that is used for cooling and cleaning in the process? Uh, yes, we want to include a water that's used for cleaning uh, and for cooling, absolutely. Now, the cooling water is, uh, is oftentimes recycled, kind of re reused or recycled because that cooling water is gonna go back to either a cooling tower or a, um, a chiller. Uh, and so it's going to be kind of recycled water. So you want to keep that in, in take that into account. But yes, cleaning, uh, cooling, um, heating, you know, all that, uh, and, and also obviously product use, we want to include all that water in the water balance. Okay, another question. I have a piece of water consuming equipment that is used for more than one process step. 
How do I include that in the water balance? Well, that's a really good question. Um, what you want to do is take a look at your inventory, and you may have, for instance, a uh, a chiller on your um, inventory list, um, and uh, so that chiller may be used for mash cooking to to cool down the mash. It may also be used um, after distillation to um, to get the uh, product out of the uh, the vapor form, uh, and so. You need to look at how much, how many gallons of water is used in one process and how many gallons of water is used in the other. And then you can divide that. Um, if 30% is used in mass cooking and 70% in distillation, then you can divide that up uh, that way. So you wanna use your inventory and your value stream map together to, um, to look at the uh, water use in, in, in each process step. And we can help you with that more if you would like to contact us. Okay. Um, uh, Samantha, here's a question for you. Are there disadvantages to benchmarking or considerations when evaluating the other data? Yeah, great question. So some of the disadvantages to benchmarking is going to be getting too caught up in the details. So you have to keep in mind with benchmarking that this is just a big data set that's averaged together. So you're taking facilities that have different types of equipment, it's maintained differently, and different types of even products. So, you know, there's scotch, bourbon, vodka, craft breweries, large domestic breweries that are all in this data set. So that's it's not an apples to apples comparison. So that's some of the disadvantages. Keep it in mind, um, you know, compare your facility to it, but don't use that as like your one stop shop for evaluating your sustainability or efficiency of your facility. Okay, great. Well, that brings us to the end of the questions. And if you do have a question, please go ahead and get it in, but we'll go ahead and start with wrapping up. And we have just a few reminders for you to please complete the post-webinar survey. We're gonna have one pop up at the end as you guys are used to. And we really do use the information uh, for two purposes. One, are we getting the message across and, and, and the way we're getting across, is it beneficial? And the other is, you know, what might be some technical assistance needs for the future? So our goal is to help you down the path that you need to go and for the industry. So uh, your feedback is really important to us. As I mentioned before, the re webinar will be available on the website, and we'll send an e email out. And also on the we website at the SSB page, as Mark mentioned, is on the sustainability calculators there, along with some other webinars on energy efficiency for the sector, sustainable value stream mapping. And then we also have resource links, including links to the two manuals that Mark referenced today. So um, if you would like a copy of the presentation, please email either Samantha or Mark and we'll send you a copy of the presentation. And if you have any other immediate questions or technical assistance requests or anything, once we end the, the presentation, please do not hesitate to email or call. We are all working remote, but we're all here to and prepared to serve you. So we look forward to working with you on any needs that you have. And with that, I will say thank you for attending the webinar. We hope that it was smooth for you and very beneficial.